Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social television magazine on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi, and I'm presenting this week's program with my wonderful co-host Bahram Surush. Hello. And Fadi Bors Puya. Hello. In this week's program, we are going to be discussing the Israeli offensive on Gaza. Uh, now, uh, social media has gone mad discussing this issue. The U.S. just recently issued a statement saying that it seems that the civilian casualties are a little too high. Outrageous to think that any civilian casualty should be acceptable. There are so many dead, so many wounded. And I find most annoying is the fact that people seem to side with either the Israeli state or with Hamas. Whereas there are all these people, both in Palestine and Israel, who are the victims of the warmongering on both sides. Let's go and listen to a background clip on this issue and then we'll be back to discuss the matter. We've also got a really interesting interview with a women's rights campaigner from Israel. And we, of course, also have the insane fatwa of the week. So stay with us until the end of the program. Since July 8th, the Israeli military has killed nearly 1,400 Palestinians in Gaza, a majority of whom have been civilians. 8,000 have been wounded. Three Israeli civilians have also been killed along with 56 Israeli soldiers during this time. At least 15 women and children were killed when the Israeli state hit a UN-run school and another 19 when it hit a crowded market on 30th of July. In the words of the wonderful Gaza Youth's Manifesto for Change, fuck Hamas, fuck Israel, fuck Fatah, fuck the UN, fuck UNWRA and fuck the USA. You know, on, on this issue, um, The Guardian, which is a paper I really despise very often because of its love affair with the Islamists, but I think it had a headline which is really true to this issue. And it was, the, it, it basically just said that the world has been disgraced. And I really think when you look at the civilian casualties uh, in Gaza, it is heart-wrenching and it could, in a sense, it could be a lot of those children could be any of our own children. How can you, in a very crowded and densely populated area, you undertake bombardment of any kind, but the area of bombardment or bombardment by, you know, how could you, how could any estate justify this? And I think this is one of the most criminal things that any estate could justify under any circumstances. You're bound to sort of you know, you, you, no matter what you do, you're going to kill a lot of people. It's nothing, nothing justifies this. And I think everybody needs to condemn this and the, the war needs to stop immediately. There's two sides to this, to, to this world. On the other, on the other side, uh, uh, Hamas does not want to, this to, uh, to end. They want this to continue because that justifies the existence. The Islamic regime of Iran actually backs and said, do not stop, carry on, carry on. I think, you know, Israeli right wing state, Hamas, they fit each other. Actually, they, they feed from each other. And in between, you have the uh, casualty of the civilians in Gaza, the biggest prison camp in the Middle East. And on the, on the other hand, you know, citizens of Israel and the you know, progressive movement are under attack in Israel as well because of this war. And, and there's no justification in, uh, by claiming that the Hamas, which I despise, and uh, we can talk about that, uh, that Hamas has uh, installed and stationed its rocket launchers in schools. In, uh, it may have, it may not have, it doesn't matter. The, you know, the thing is, if you are attacking an area which you are almost certain that civilians will be the main victims, then you are committing war crime. It, you can't say it because the, my enemy had put the uh, uh, rocket launchers there. Oh, okay, if they have put it, you have to find another way of targeting the enemy soldiers or whatever. So that justification is as outrageous as all the bombing and the carnage that is going on, and which the Israeli state is certain that the majority of the people killed and wounded and displaced will be the ordinary people. And uh, I absolutely agree with uh, Faribors that uh, Hamas and the Israeli state are feeding off each other because Hamas has repeatedly refused to a ceasefire. And the Iranian state as well, the Khamenei, uh, has said that you should not accept by any means any ceasefire. So the people have been caught in between 
and both of them want the carnage to continue. I mean, you, you often hear the question issue of proportionality in this matter. And the reality is that Hamas would have killed as many, if not more, if it, if it could. Israel's defense systems are a lot better. The point, though, is that one civilian is one too many. The UN has said that Israel might have committed war crimes. I think it's certain that they've created war, they've, they've uh, committed war crimes. You know, and what um, it, you know, just angers me the most is watching how there are people who either defend and legitimize the Israeli state by saying, well, Hamas has put its rockets there, and those who defend Hamas by saying, well, it's Gaza is under occupation. I think what we really need to do is stop sharing in the collective blame of Hamas and the Israeli state and start actually seeing people, you know, Absolutely. real and people think, on, on the ground. It's, it's important because the voice of both Sit, uh, civilians and citizens of Israel, you can't hear that. You can't hear the peace movement. You can't hear people actually against the war, people who are, are for two-state solution. On the other hand, you can't hear the voice of the civilians because constantly Hamas you know, represents itself as the voice of the Palestinian people, which they're not actually. They don't represent anything. In. And it's important that the civilized civilization and civilized world, you know, air the views of these people. But the first thing is that immediate end to the, the carnage that is going on. It must stop. That's, that's the demand of a civilization. Nothing can justify a continuation of this war, even for a minute, and it must stop now. I think that's very important. And both the Israeli state and Hamas are committing uh, war crimes. Uh, Israel, by continuing the bombardments and indiscriminate killing of the people, and Hamas by refusing to a ceasefire, so, and I, I also heard that even people who, who were trying to flee the borders and Hamas uh, guards were chasing them and ordering them to come back to get to their places because they have said that they want this to turn into a political victory for them. At what price? They don't care. So both are war criminals. And uh, it's important to know that this is not a war between the people of Israel and the people of Palestine. And these people, they don't... Re it, the Israeli state doesn't represent the Israeli people. Hamas is not the resistant, as some on the left try to say Hamas is the resistant. No, they're part of this war. They want the war to, uh, uh, to carry on, to continue. So both sh uh, should be condemned categorically. Yeah, I think uh, very often, you know, yeah, um, this whole idea of, you know, that this is you know, that these, uh, both these warmongering terrorists, I Israeli state terrorism and Hamas' terrorism represents the people, is the sort of idea that the ruling class represents the, the population at large. And in a sense, it's sort of like seeing it this way is like saying, well, then the 7-7 seven, seven bombers, let's say if they were angry at the Iraq war, are justified in attacking an underground um, s station because everybody is collectively to blame for what a government does. And what it doesn't see is all that resistance that's taking place. I was reading an article in which, uh, you know, uh, at a funeral where one of the women there had 10 of her family members killed by Hamas and another who was cursing both the Israeli state and Hamas. It, the people are not, you know, a homogeneous group. There are, there are so many people who are opposed to this and they're fed up. I mean, imagine living in that situation. You would want it to stop, you know, unless you're a mercenary of Hamas or the Israeli state. You want it to stop. No, absolutely. Imagine for a moment that you live in, in Gaza. You actually don't want to be bombarded. You want to get away. Physically want to be go away. Hamas does not allow this. Hamas wants people to actually, uh, people in Gaza to be killed so it could justify its existence. On the other hand, there's been, uh, um, you know, uh, um, Gaza has been sealed off by the Israeli state and the people cannot get away. The, 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 for, for many years, both in terms of sanction, in terms of travel, people are not trapped. This is the biggest prison in Middle East and I think the world needs to react immediately and needs to be outraged. And I think the Gaza youth actually, as we saw in that clip, really summed it up beautifully. And, and, and said that, you know, fuck all, all these sides who don't represent us. It's a political game and maneuvering amongst themselves, conflict amongst themselves, and the people are just the victims. And I think that's the position that the people should take. Otherwise, this will continue forever. And I think, can I just say, there is one solution. It's non-religious and secular states, both in Israel and, and in, uh, in Palestine. These are the, bear in mind, be very clear, both sides are religious 
governments. You have on the one hand, you have the Jewish uh, sort of government, which is, draws its legitimacy uh, from religion. And on the other side, you have the Islamist uh, uh, Hamas, which draws its re re uh, um, legitimacy from, uh, from religion. I think that it's very clear there's one solution, actually, on both sides. You know, we should have non-religious government. Uh, non government. We'll have a better Middle East, I think. Let's now go and uh, listen to an interview with Nira Yuval Davis. She is a founding member of Women Against Fundamentalisms and also a founding member of the International Research Network on Women in Militarized Conflict Zones. And then we'll be back to further discuss this issue. Don't go away. Um, thank you so much for joining our program, Nira Yuval Davis. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. It's a us. pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, obviously, about the Israeli-Palestinian issue, you know, the, the human tragedy that's unfolding on everybody's television screens. I'd like to know your feelings on that. Yes, it is uh, a human tragedy, and it's more than that. And obviously, it's important to emphasize that it is not something that started now, or even at 67, or even at 48. This is something that has been going on in, in different ways, and not to the terrible and horrible way that it is now, but it was always in many ways horrible, since the beginning of the settler colonial project of the Zionist movement. Um, the Zionist movement sought to solve the so-called Jewish problem in terms of the terrible persecution and anti-Semitism and what culminated in the extermination and genocide of Jews under the Nazis and before that in various pogroms in East Europe. But of course, um, they did it uh, in the form that was popular during that time of settler colonialism. And in a way, the indigenous people, in this case, the Palestinians, were completely invisible. Or when they were visible, there were all kinds of assumptions that either they will disappear or they will by uh, assimilation, or like in the utopian alt Neuland romance of uh, Herzl, that they will be willingly a second-rate citizen. So this is when it all kind of started. But what is happening now in Gaza is, of course, the latest manifestation and the whole evolution um, and, and various dislocations that this conflict has happened during more than 100 years and um, with all its uh, national, regional and global uh, implications. I mean, in a sense, uh, when you look at this issue, you often find people either siding with the Israeli state or siding with Hamas yeah. and the Islamists. Uh, whereas, in fact, there are so many people who are opposed to both and who want real peace. Yes, I mean, we should not uh, forget that the birth of Hamas uh, was by the security service held and supported by the security services of Israel, the same way the Taliban was blessed and supported by the CIA because they thought that this old British imperial uh, note of divide and rule is uh, going to be the best weapon in order to um, weaken uh, the PLO and divide the Palestinian res resistance. Unfortunately, they succeeded too well, but what of course they didn't in this kind of uh, racist kind of superiority, they didn't kind of think that the Hamas uh, and the Palestinians in general are not just puppets, they have their own agency and of course they were using the support that has been uh, given to them in order to promote their own uh, project, which is of course um, Muslim fundamentalism. And unfortunately now this is a very wide and rising political project of belonging and of uh, invasion and we see for the first time uh, in the history of the Middle East we see a series of territorial controls by Muslim fundamentalists 
in terms of the ISIS in Syria and what is happening in Iraq and what is happening in Libya. So we cannot just, and, and of course all the ongoing uh, fights in, in Egypt, so we cannot see the role of uh, Hamas in uh, Gaza in an isolated way. And this is one of the reasons that once the Palestinian uh, Authority and the PLO are willing to have a unity government with the Hamas, Israel became so scared by it, and in a way what is happening now is a direct result to the Israeli government being absolutely determined not to facilitate this uni government, and in this sense they achieved this immediate, um, immediate goal, but at what cost? The other goal that they have in order to end Palestinian resistance, especially in Gaza, which has complete blockade, and especially now when the military junta in Egypt cooperates so closely with Israel, so they don't have any outlets also on the Egyptian side, as well as the Israeli side, as well as the, the sea, then in a way they have almost nothing to lose, except that of course those that they are very willing to sacrifice the women and children and the people. But on the other hand, people will not resist them because there is no alternative. Unless Israel and the world, by pressurizing Israel, will allow space for alternatives to emerge, that they are not going to exist. And sometimes when you look at the situation, you get the sense that neither Israel, the government, nor Hamas want peace. They don't want a, a solution because they sort of seem to be feeding off and uh, using this, uh, this situation as a legitimization for their own uh, Yes, but I, I mean, the thing is though, when people said peace, and in Israel I grew up this kind of uh, notion of peace, I mean, each side won peace on condition that nothing else will change. And definitely Israel wants peace when all its privileged position to uh, remain. And the Palestinians would maybe agree peace when they dominate, uh, you know, and the, the whole kind of settler uh, project would, would disappear. But you cannot solve one calamity by creating another, in the same way that you couldn't solve the persecution of Jews by the establishment of a Zionist settler colonial project, you cannot um, solve. I mean, there is a reality of a, a people already for more than a hundred years that they have no other homeland and they belong to that country. In the same way that another settler colonial project in the United States, in Australia, in Canada, in South Africa, the people are there. But unfortunately, unlike in South Africa, there haven't been an emergence of a counter-ideology in which both the indigenous people and the settlers who want coexistence, who want peace, who want, but on equal terms, um, to develop. There have been beginnings some years ago, but of course at the moment people don't see the space. Uh, I mean, one of the differences that one can see is that in 1982 when Israel invaded Beirut, there was a mass demonstration of more than 40,000 Israelis, most of them still saw themselves as Zionists, who protested against the war. Now there are several hundred and they are beaten up. I mean, the extreme right in Israel is now in a, in a mode of terrible celebratory um, racialization that they've never been before. People are, I saw, dancing, death to the Arabs, celebrating that children were killed in school and beating up uh, people in the street and if they refuse to, uh, uh, if they're Arabs and if they're Jews and refuse to say death to the Arabs, they beat them as well and they call them that they're not human beings. That, so this is a fascization in a way that is unprecedented in the history of Israel. Although the racialized Zionist ideology has been there from the beginning, it has never ever been so horrific. And this is what's so frightening. And of course, the response to it from the other side is not going to see sudden enlightenment and humanism and tolerance. Everything is just going to reinforce each other. And this is really bleak. I mean, it's bleak, and do you see any hope for the sort of uh, 
you know, the, well, the resistance. I think, and I think the politics of hope is very important in order for not all of us not to kind of just completely despair and give up. And in this sense, Gramsci, pessimism of the mind, optimism of the soul is very uh, important. Um, and there are youngsters, as well as older people, who see the paradoxes, the horrible catch-22 situations, and they do want the way out. But emotions are not enough. You need to have some kind of a lever of power to be able to change it. And this is why, unfortunately, only the superpowers are going to be able to put enough pressure on Israel in order to, to do it. I mean, but today there was declaration of 72 hours so-called humanitarian ceasefire that was broken by both sides after two hours. They were supposed to all meet in, in Egypt. I mean, very interestingly also, in this uh, recent round, the interest of the Gulf um, regimes of Qatar and, 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 and Saudi and, 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 and as well as Turkey, I mean, the regional kind of power and, and oil economies and so on are very much also much more focused. The, a gas has been discovered in the Mediterranean between near Israel, Gaza and Cyprus. So this is another neoliberal kind of uh, pressure to focus around the issue of Gaza. So it, so do, it doesn't do look that, very... What do you think the solution is to the situation? Well, I mean, when you say solution, there is a... Well, I mean, how can we get solution, a two-state... ideological solution. I mean, how can we get a two-state solution? I don't, I don't think that this, 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 most of those who preach two-state solution um, see the conflict between Israel and Palestine as a border solution. And in a way, in Gaza now, after the... Israeli settlements were dismantled by the uh, withdrawal under Sharon uh, because they didn't want to continue a direct rule over Gaza because it is such a horrible mess for them. So it does look as if it's a territorial conflict, although what Israel is now done, the, the so-called buffer zone, is already more than a third of this very tiny territory of Gaza in which millions live. So, so, so this in itself is, is horrible. But 20% of Israel, Israeli citizens are Palestinians. And there are so many settlers since 67. So this is, you know, how many years? It's, it's almost 50 years. So, so you cannot solve it by two states unless you are going to generate a tremendous uh, exchange of population and, and so on. And of course, a tremendous exchange of population have taken place in 48 by the creation of the refuge, Palestinian refugee problem. But in a way, in the Os so-called Oslo pro peace process, the refugees were kept completely out of the picture. So where are they going to live? Most of the people had loyalty and belonging to their own village, to their own or, or region. So. The whole notion of Palestine, I mean, Israel doesn't have borders in, in the kind of conventional kind of terms, and, and Palestine doesn't have borders also in this kind of way. So, probably, eventually, like in South Africa, like in other settler societies, people will have to learn to live uh, with each other, but at the same time, or create some kind of uh, on, on a, an equi equitable and agreed process of fair, but this was going to reinforce such racializations. But at the moment, the, the, the underlying conditions for either solution do not exist. You need a, a process of rapprochement in which some trust will be built. And there was an historical window of opportunity after the first Gulf War in the Madrid conference in which Israel for the first time realized that they cannot solve the issue in a military way, in which they 
realized that United States is their ally, but in the Gulf War, they were embarrassed by them. They forbade them to, to, to fight. They just put them in these uh, uh, shelters from the gas and, and, and so on. So then there was an opportunity, but there was the negotiation started in Washington, and then in the back rooms in Oslo, they did a parallel process in which peace was used as a continuation of war in order to crystallize Israeli domination over the Palestinians. And as we all know, eventually all this broke down and with it, the beginning of trust and the beginning of hope and broken trust and hope are much more difficult to reestablish. So in some way, when we were all a bit more innocent before the beginning of the Oslo process, it was easier than, than, than now. But of course, eventually, we are part of history, so there will be some kind of a resolution, even if this resolution would be the continuation of Israel as a warfare society, the continuation of the Palestinian society as a refugee society. It's, but uh, what you call solution is very rarely, there is no end of history in which like in the chess game when it's finished. It never finishes. It always continues to move and meet, metamorphose in a way that all too often for us on the left and feminist and anti-racist and anti-fundamentalist uh, is not what we would like to see or what we struggle to see. I mean, but that's my, one of my down moments, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you very yeah. much. You know, when, when you look at this issue, for me, I mean, very often, I can't even tell the difference between an Israeli and a Palestinian, really. I mean, between a lot of people living in the region. And, and in a sense, you think that it's just really a lottery of birth, that someone ended up being Palestinian, another one ended up being Israeli. And in a sense, you know, if it wasn't for this sort of, um, you know, this sort of animosity that the government is creating, the governments and, and Hamas are, that people could so easily live in peace. And you are seeing, even though there is an attempt to make it seem that the public are behind the Israeli state or Hamas, you do see so many acts of resistance and opposition. The Gaza youth is one example. You see uh, on, on social media, you're seeing Israelis and Palestinians kissing, saying that they'll never be enemies. They refuse to be enemies. And I think, you know, we need to start legitimizing that resistance rather than legitimizing Hamas and Israel because that's how we're going to see a beginning to the end of this conflict. And I agree. I think the voice of people of Israel in term, you know, is not properly heard. We hear the Israeli government. We hear the ripened Likud government. We hear the most, you know, reactionary elements from Israeli society pretend to represent uh, Israeli population and Israeli citizens. They don't represent you know, uh, uh, people, people of Israel, D despite the fact that there's a lot of engineering, public uh, sort of uh, opinion uh, engineering in, in Israel to make sure that the right wing constantly and the system is being built so right wing coalitions get into power. On the other hand, well, you know, it's very clearly laid out that in, um, in, in Gaza, Hamas is only in power but brute force. And I think that's very, uh, very important that Hamas does not represent the civilians that exist in Gaza. They've actually took over by murdering a lot of the opposition. So they don't represent nobody. It's important that people like us represent both the uh, Israeli civilians as well as people of Gaza. And I think oftentimes uh, Israel is portrayed as a victim here. You know, the Israeli state is portrayed as a victim very often and that it, it has to defend, it has to massacre all these people because it has no choice but to defend itself. Obviously, you know, the, the people of Israel have a right to their own state, but so do the Palestinians. And in a sense, the I think 
one of the key things is the fact that they do, we've raised this in this program, but one that we hear less about is that they both, both the Israeli state and Hamas, have a real interest in keeping, and also many of the regional powers, in keeping this conflict See, alive. Yeah. That's the problem with the Israeli-Palestinian issue. There's a very simple solution to it, the recognition of the Palestinian people's right to state of their own, to statehood. But what is stopping it is that a lot of political forces, religious forces, are capitalizing on it for their own ends. The right in Israel, the right uh, and, uh, and within the Israeli state as well, they do not want the Palestinian issue to go away. They want it to stay there and they use these arguments about defense and all that. Actually, they welcome a force like Hamas. And there was the situation, and I think it's actually a fact, they supported the Hamas financially sponsored it at the beginning because they wanted to have this sort of reason for continuing. And on the other hand, you've got Islamic forces like the Iranian regime, you've got the Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Hamas itself who have nothing to do with the Palestinian issue but are using this issue for their own ends. And this is extremely important to distinguish between that. This is not the Palestinian issues. The Palestinian issue has been hijacked by all these reactionary forces. And it is time now to bring it out and to say that you guys, you have nothing to do with the suffering of the Palestinian people. And there's no animosity with the, with the, uh, with the people of Israel and with, with the people of, and um, between these and the Palestinian people. And there is a very viable, practical solution to the whole situation, were it not for all these yeah. reactionary actors. I, absolutely. The, I, can I just yeah. add, the, you know, the in between well, all this, been, absolutely, yeah. the in between, do not forget there is both right-wing uh, groups in Israel who actually want this to continue, and the anti-Semitism that exists in Middle East and actually yeah. capitalizing on this. And, and it's very important that this force, and also in Europe, there are a lot of anti-Semitics who actually support this situation because they want to blame the Jews and the Jewish. And I feel that's very important that to, to condemn anti-Semitism that exists. And, and you know, one of the here. things is there's, there is a you know, huge peace movement in Israel, and you know, recently they're being attacked by the far right. And unless we come to their aid and to the in support of them and solidarity with them and people in Palestine, we're not going to see an end to this. So, you know, um, do tell us what you think about this issue. We've reached the end of our program. Before we go, we have our insane fatwa of the week. And this week's fatwa is uh, Turkey's deputy prime minister. It's not really a fatwa, but it is, uh, because he's one of the co-founders of the ruling Islamist Justice and Development Party. And he said that a man should be moral. Are you guys Woman moral? Or man? <laughs> but women should be moral as well. They should know what is decent and what is not decent. And we shouldn't laugh out loudly in front of the world and should preserve our decency at all times. <laughs> Sorry, so, uh, and I think the great thing is, <laughs> Turkish women have already been already giving laughing. him a good response by <laughs> laughing out really loud. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, fake laughter. Um, anyway, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you've enjoyed it. Watch us next week. Send us your comments. We hope you have a wonderful week. Until then, see you next week. Bye.